So in this video, I'd like to go back down memory lane and look at some of the things that I uh, am very nostalgic about uh, in the early days of the Apple II. Um, so let's have a look at those things. So this is a dream setup, an Apple II with two floppy drives and, a, and actually branded Apple hardware and also a monitor. And they were only, generally only monochrome monitors back then, so green and white, maybe, maybe amber and white. Um, maybe black and white <laughs> okay so that was a dream setup in, in 1980 if you had this you were king of the hill you were king of the mountain you were you were the big computer guy on a block okay and uh, <laughs> very few people had this in their homes some schools were lucky enough to have it my school had a setup like this for 650 students to share one Apple II computer with two floppy drives for 650 students to share okay so uh, for example, in maths class, they started teaching us basic in um, in the early 80s. And uh, by then, a, lo a lot of the computer guys, me included, had already done all the commands. So it was just revision for us. We got full marks. We didn't have to do much work. We were busy learning machine language by then or exploring other things, exploring more advanced topics. But um, So there's a maths class with one Apple II computer <laughs> and, uh, and we're learning basic programming. So the teacher would write, you know, print, very, the various forms, forms of the print statement and go to and for loop and if statements, they'd all just be written on the board. And um, if you were lucky after class or after school or before school or whatever, you might get a turn at the Apple II. Uh, later on, the school bought three more computers. So about two years later, the school bought three more computers, but these weren't Apple II computers. These were Apple compatible or Apple basic com compatible. And they had no floppy drives. They just had uh, the basic machine and a, and a monitor. So they weren't Apples at all. They were just Apple clones. And they could run Apple basic programs. But they couldn't run Apple machine code. They weren't fully compatible. Okay, so they had, we still had one Apple II Euro Plus, like, like this machine, or similar to this machine. And then we had three other basic machines with a monitor. No floppy drives, just a monitor and the keyboard and mouse. And I think there was a communal cassette deck that you could plug into various machines and save your work and load your work. I think that's how it worked. It's a long time ago, uh, four decades ago, <laughs> over four decades. Um, so, but anyway, but the, but the, but the, but the, but the prize machine was um, to get on the Apple II. If you could get on the Apple II and save your work on floppy disk, you were, you were doing really well. Uh, a, a guy in school called David, David H. I won't say his last name, but David H. He was, always on the Apple II and I remember people yelling at him saying, when are you going to get off the Apple II, David? We want to, we want to do something. And usually it was playing games because the Apple II was the best for games uh, because it was compatible with machine code Apple II games, of course, and basic Apple II games. Whereas the other machines, you could try and load, say, artillery that was written in basic on one of those other clone machines and there'd be errors with the program. It, wouldn't, it wasn't fully basic compatible either, but it was basically basic compatible with the Apple II. If you stayed on the main commands, you'd be okay. But if you went into peaks and pokes, then you fell off the rails really quick on these other machines. Okay, so that was that was the ideal machine. Um, now, after I finished high school, I worked I, during the final two years of high school. I worked on I worked on a farm on weekends, and uh, after I finished high school, I went and worked on the farm full time, and saved up all my money, and I bought an Apple II clone which was basically just, just this base unit here without the Apple II badge on it, it had, it had, had nothing. And, um, and one, I bought one floppy drive eventually and I used a black and white TV as my monitor. Okay, and I had to set up a modulator. My, my brother sold me up a, mo a modulator to connect the Apple II to, to the black and white TV. So I had one floppy drive, a, a basic Apple II Plus and a, a black and white TV as a monitor. That was my setup in, in, uh, in mid in uh, early, early 93. That's what, I, that's what I got. Uh, and mid-1993, I added the single floppy drive. So until mid-1993, I was doing everything on tape, <laughs> which was interesting interesting times. Okay, Occasionally, I could borrow a floppy disk drive from a friend, but he'd only let me have it for the weekend. I'd have to have it back by Monday. And, um, and um, so I, I could then use disks to try and save stuff to tape and from tape and, and that sort of thing. And, um, and then the rest of the time, I was working on tape. 
It was pretty bad. So that's why I saved up and bought a floppy disk drive as well. One single floppy disk drive. And that was my setup for 1983, 1984, 1985. That was my computer setup at home. And I had an Akai cassette, radio cassette player, very similar to this one. Not quite exactly this one. Mine's in the storage shed um, and I need to dig it out. Um, so you would put a tape in there and hook the, the record, the mono and the, the, uh, the line out and the, and the line in to the back of the Apple II. And then by pushing the play and the rewind and the fast forward and the, and the, and the record buttons and things on like this, you could save and load programs to disk. And you had to pay very, very special attention to this counter here. So you have to keep records of what you were saving and where. Because you'd have a 60-minute tape, and one of your basic programs might only take up 10 seconds of that tape, or 20 seconds of that tape, if you're writing small programs. You know, 10 or 20 seconds. So it would start and end at a certain location on the tape. And then you'd leave a gap of, say, 10 units on the counter. And then, uh, and then you'd um, record the next program onto the tape. So you, to get to a certain location on a tape and load a program, one of, your, one of your games that you're working on or one of your programs you're working on, you might have to rewind to the start of the tape, reset the counter, and then fast forward through the tape until you got to the right location, stop it, get, get type load on the Apple II, press play on the, uh, on the cassette player, and hit the enter key, and then your program would load in. Okay, and then you wait till, wait till it finished loading, and then you press the stop button again on the Apple on, on the cassette player. Okay, so it was quite a journey. You had to keep rewinding the tape and then fast forwarding to that location and uh, and uh, watching the counter very closely. And if you change tapes, you'd have to rewind the tape, reset the counter, and then fast forward to where you needed to be on that tape. So it was a very manual process. The Apple II didn't control a cassette player. Like, like the Commodore 64 was a, a little bit better. It would control a cassette player as well, or it could, um, I think, but uh, from memory. But the Apple II couldn't, couldn't control except play. Um, and so you'd have to <laughs> press press keys on the Apple II or type commands in and then make sure you're pressing the right buttons here, otherwise you could really screw things up. And it was very easy to overwrite your work or erase your work or lose, lose if, if you didn't uh, keep keep careful records, if you lost your page or, or diary or whatever that you're writing the record numbers in. Um, you, you, if you weren't organized, you could easily lose track of things very quickly. So here's the first tape I used on the Apple II, and this would be very early 1983. When I when I bought my Apple II clone, my Apple II Plus clone, and bought it home, the only thing I could store it on was cassette tape. The only thing I could store programs on was cassette tape because I didn't have a floppy drive until about six months into the year. So very, very early 1983. So why did I buy an Apple II for home? This was quite unusual. None of my school friends did this. Uh, you know, no, no, very few people I knew had Apple IIs at home. There was one other guy that was a friend of a friend of a friend that had an Apple II at home, and I used to borrow his Apple II floppy drive occasionally uh, until I bought one. Um, maybe I could borrow it once a month or once every two months. That was sort of the, the, all, all he'd allow. He was, did, didn't want to borrow it. Fair enough, he only had one floppy drive. He didn't want to lend it out. And... Um, and uh, so everything I was doing was onto tape, saving to tape, loading from tape. And this is my first tape, it was a BASF tape. These were really good quality tapes. And I, I saved and loaded thousands of programs onto tapes. Uh, well, certainly hundreds. And um, I never had any errors with, with tapes failing. Okay, but BASF was a good brand. And uh, I tried to use good branded tapes, um, especially early on. Later on, I started using cheaper tapes and uh, just to see if they would work. And, um, and they seem to work fine as well. And then, and then six months, after six months, I changed to floppy disk and I virtually never used tape again. Okay, but I used to save, basic was pretty easy. You just type save and load on the Apple II and make sure the tape was in the right place and then play or record, or, or play and record, you had to, to, to get the to tape recorder to record, you had to hold down the play and the record buttons to get it to record. So you could synchronize things pretty easily and use a tape counter to keep track of where you were on a tape. That was pretty easy. And then after about a month of saving and loading basic programs, I saved Artillery, which is an Apple II, Apple II game, Artillery, and uh, Star Trek and, and games like that onto the tape. And my, heaps of my own programs. I was writing heaps of my own programs, saving them to tape. And, uh, and then I started... Uh, the, the friend of the friend that I told you about earlier, he told me how to save machine code to tape. And you had to go call minus 151 and type in some commands in Monitor, Apple Monitor. 
to get the length of the program and uh, and the starting address, and then you could use those command center to write a customized save command to, to save it out to tape. Um, and then loading back in was similar. You had to, you had to save the, the, the memory address and the length and load it back in using the same sort of parameters. So uh, I, I didn't just save and write basic programs to tape. We also saved and loaded um, machine code programs to tape. For example, um, Apple Panic and uh, Star Castle and, uh, and games like that I could save to, to tape as well, machine code games. Um, and, and again, no one else I knew did that. The, the, the friend of the friend did it and um, or, or knew how to do it and told me, uh, but no one else I've ever encountered saved or loaded machine code programs to tape. Uh, I've talked to a lot of people on Usenet and, and things and on, on various Apple II forums on, on, on the web, uh, going back to 1994, and no one else I know has ever done it. I don't know. I'm sure there are people out there. It's just, it was very rare. I mean, everybody had a floppy drive. Very few people were scrounging around like me <laughs> with tapes. Okay, so floppy disk was definitely the way to go. But that's my first tape. Wow, what a beautiful tape. And uh, yeah, I'll talk, I'll talk about, about that more later as we go. So these are the records you sort of had to keep. So I, I was working on a loop, and these aren't actual records, I just made them up. I've still got one of my books with the actual records in a storage shed, but I, I haven't dug it out for this video. But these are the sort of records you had to keep. So at, at starting location 10 on the tape, I've got my prototype version 0.1001 for Lunar Lander. At 40 on the tape, that's where version two is. Uh, at location 70 on the tape, that's might be where Wordsworth Companion lives. That's an Apple II program to help me look up words for playing uh, Scrabble and things. It's, uh, help me look up words. Uh, and then I was working, I just like writing pi calculators, and this is one of the ones I wrote that was starting at location 100 on tape. And then the game Artillery and Star Trek might have been at those locations. And then I worked on Lunar Lander some more. So all of these programs are all under one side of the one tape. That's why I had to keep very careful records and watch that little tape counter. Rewind to the side of the tape and fast forward to location 180, which would take maybe a minute, <laughs> maybe 30 seconds, maybe a minute. And then you could press play uh, on, on the tape and, and type in load on the Apple, Apple II and click enter and press them together and it would start loading the program. Fun times. <laughs> Lots of records to keep. You have to be very, very meticulous with your records. And there's my first floppy disk. Um, what a beautiful disk. All battle worn and battle scarred. When you pick it up, it's really thin from, <laughs> from being squashed in, in textbooks and squashed in school bags and squashed in, um, you know, and amongst other disks. It's all floppy and skinny and it's a really funny old disk. Uh, when, when, often when you see floppy disks, they, 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 they're quite wide. Maybe it may be a, a match thickness, maybe, that sort of thickness, if you know what a wooden match looks like. Uh, but mine's much thinner than that. It's, it's half that width. It's been compacted and compressed over the years, especially in the early 80s. Uh, my school got the Apple II in February 1980, and that's when I, and there was a whole bunch of people using the, the computer then, a whole bunch of people in my class started using it, and they were trying to get me to use it as well. And um, and I bought a floppy disk. Floppy disk, everyone, uh, the school had a, a collection of floppy disks, and you, you could buy them off the school. And, uh, I, and I bought this floppy disk here that you see, and that was my very first floppy disk, and that was in 1980, around about February 1980 that was. Um, and uh, originally this disk was Stuart's, Stuart was another guy in the class, and there was no discs left in the cupboard for me to buy, so, and Stuart had just bought this one, the last disk, and he wanted to get me into the computer club, they'd started a computer club, and he wanted to get me into the computer club, so he sold me his disk, I just gave him $5, and, and, uh, and he was going to wait. He, he had a couple of discs already, or a bunch of discs, and he was going to wait to some more discs. The school bought more discs and buy off them. Um, as a green corp disc, it's been notched, okay? And so Apple II, Apple II discs, you could only put them in the drive one way and store on one side of the disc. The discs weren't up. The, the, the disc said, might have, might have said double sided. On the label somewhere, they might have said double sided. But the Apple II only wrote to one side of the disc. So if you wanted to use the other side of the disc, you had to spin it over and notch the disc. Unless, you had, unless you're lucky enough to buy pre-notched discs, you had to notch it yourself. And I cut, I cut this little notch out here by putting another disc on top and cutting it out with some very accurate 
uh, side cutters that I had, very accurate side cutters, and I cut that out there with those. So like like electrical plies for, for cutting wires. Um, I've still got the plies upstairs. <laughs> still got the plies upstairs. I think. No, I can't have. No, these these no, they're not. They're, they're long gone. Um, no, the plies are long gone. Sorry. And um, so that that notching the discs gave you two sides of the disc. Okay. And the other thing you could do, you can see a bit of red tape there. The other thing you could do is on the back of the disc there was a join on the back of the disc where the, where the two parts of the plastic joined and you could try and stick a knife in there and saw it backwards and forwards and try and cut through the join and open up the top of the disc like an envelope like, like, a, like a really stiff envelope and pull the disc out and turn it over and slide it in okay and some people did that so they didn't have to notch their discs okay and why wouldn't you want to notch the discs well there was a rumor going around in the early 80s that if you um, try to write on the other side of a single-sided non-notched disc that uh, you could damage your disc drive. It was all a rumour started by who knows, who knows who. I think it was started by the disc manufacturers to try and scare people into buying notched discs. Okay, So this thing went round that if your disc was notched, you couldn't use it in my drive. Libraries, at, at, just down the road from my school, uh, public libraries, had a, they might have had a single Apple II. You couldn't use not notch discs. The librarians would check your discs as you walked into the library, and if there are any notched ones there, they would take them out of your stack of discs and put them aside for you to collect on the way out. Okay, that's how that's how paranoid people were about notched discs. I still remember the librarians doing this. They were very cute librarians. I'd always made sure I had a lot of notched discs in my collection so we could stand there chatting for a while. <laughs> they were two beautiful ladies running the library, and um, and it was lovely to try and chat to them. And I was only a shy. A shy teenager. I'm a shy, I'm a shy adult now, but I'm, I was only a shy teenager back then. So, you know, a, a minute talking to these lovely ladies was just was just such 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 a nice thing to be able to do. So you just try and make small talk, and my small talk was really bad, of course. But um, it's just trying to trying to talk to some lovely lo lovely looking ladies because I was a a teenager with hormones racing around in my body. So they they would pull out all the notch discs and put them aside, and then you could only take the ones that hadn't been notched or that were professionally notched. By the factory, and one thing about it's not just the discs that bring back nostalgia, but the sounds that the disc drives used to make, the grunting and grinding and squeaking sounds, the uh, the Apple II disc drives used to make, even the 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 proper Apple II equipment, branded Apple II equipment, used to make these horrible horrible sounds. And if you were in a library, for example, or in a classroom, but in a library, I especially remember it in the libraries, because two of my local libraries had Apple IIs. One was just uh, about two or three k's from school, and the other one was about uh, five or six k's from school. And I used to ride 10 kilometres a day each way on my push bike to get to school. And so I used to go past both libraries, and I could stop in at one or the other. I used to like stopping in at one of them, the one that was closer to school, because that had the two beautiful librarian ladies working there. But anyway, anyway. That's when I used to like stopping in. And also, the, the one that was closer to school was a quieter library. You had a much better chance of getting on the Apple II. So you go, you go after school and, and, uh, and sign a book uh, and sign in on the Apple II. Although once you knew, they didn't make you sign the book. But they'd still check your discs to make sure they weren't notched, like I was saying. Um, but um, you could be working on the Apple II there and, and you'd, you'd load a game and turn the sound off or whatever and be playing games most of the time. And, uh, and the disk driver would be grunting and groaning as it, as, it, as it loaded the game in. And people on the other side of the library, okay, not a big library, we're talking about you know, the, the size of maybe two, two, two average school classrooms joined together was the size of the library. And people right down the far end of the library would be glaring at you and looking at you, wondering what you're doing to that poor Apple too, because it would be grunting and grinding, grinding away as it, as it loaded, the, loaded the game or loaded the program you're working on or, or whatever. Okay, grunts, grinds, squeaks, squawks, clacks. And people down the far end of the library would be looking at you going, what's going on? What are you doing? <laughs> Even a librarian sometimes would be looking over saying, gosh, that disk drive is making a lot of strange noises. <laughs> but that was just the Apple II disk drives. They were so loud. Grunts, grinds would make people down the far end of the library turn and stare at you, look, turn and stare at you and gawp at you and look at you and glare at you sometimes, you know? You're making too much noise in the library. <laughs> it's not me, it's a, it's a disk drive. Funny days. They were such funny days. 
So this is the sleeve. Uh, that, so this is a disc sleeve. This is what you slid your floppy disk into to protect the uh, the magnetic magnetic part of the disc which was exposed. So you'd slide it into these disc sleeves. And here's a verbatim one. So this is the back of the disc sleeve. And they've got warnings there like don't touch the magnetic surface. Make sure you put it in a disc drive the right way. Don't put magnets near your floppy drive because that would have, floppy disk because that would erase the disc or damage your disc. Don't bend it. Um, make sure you put it in the sleeve after you've used it to keep it protected. And uh, don't don't make it too hot or too cold. So don't put it in the oven, for example. Okay. And these sorts of warnings are on the back of every disc, every floppy disk you bought. You turn it you turn it over, and there'd be similar sort of warnings. Maybe they'd be vertical, maybe they'd be horizontal, but they'd be similar sort of warnings. And these are the ones that run on this verbatim, verbatim floppy disk, uh, disk sleeve. Okay, but not all disk warnings were like that. There was uh, a, a, a crew called the Beagle Brothers, which, which were big in the early days of the Apple II. And um, they used to do this sort of thing. And they, were, they became really famous and really popular in uh, amongst Apple II users because they had such a great sense of humour about everything they did. For example, don't step on a disc, don't set it on fire, don't feed it to your pet, pet crocodile, don't stick it in the toaster, don't play coits with it, <laughs> don't make paper planes out of it, don't use it as a toilet roll holder, and don't fly it like a kite. You know, everything just had a great sense of humour with Beagle Brothers. Even their advertising. Um, it says it, it, on, on his bald head in his ad, he's got, do not write in this space. <laughs> so, everything back then these guys did uh, was a great little company and uh, Beagle Brothers, they used to produce things like um, peaks and poke charts, that's that's what I used for them. Um, they distribute these peaks and poke charts which were way, ways to do things on the Apple II Basic. You could type in peak and poke commands. To Poke was putting certain values at certain memory locations which you couldn't do normally via Basic and peak was to read certain memory locations that you couldn't do with normal Basic commands. So peak and poke were two really powerful commands which lets you extend the Basic and do much more powerful things and um, and they produce peak and poke charts and, and other things as well they produce software and uh, utilities and all sorts of things but their peak and poke charts is really what started them off and um, and they, 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 they all, all, all their discs came with these warnings on that they that, that they sold their discs and uh, just beautiful the early days of Apple II everything was done with a real sense of fun uh, you know, nobody took themselves too serious because they didn't know if they're going to be there in a year's time. They just were just having fun doing what they love doing, and th and that really came through in companies like Beagle Brothers. Hats off to you guys, really. Hats off. Um, I know you, I know you're still going to things like Kansas Fest, and they still they still do business at Kansas Fest. The so guys are still going, and hats off to you guys. If ever if ever I meet you, I'm going to shake your hand, and ask for your autographs. Really, you've made the Apple II early days. Of the Apple II so much fun. You and companies like you. It wasn't just Beagle Brothers. But um, they're the ones that I remember, remember, remember most. And of course, you can't talk about the early days of the Apple II without talking about the games and the software that was available. Okay, and uh, wow, what 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 beautiful stuff! Castle Wolfenstein. You know, when you got um, SS guards, you got to you got to shoot or destroy with grenades and and chests. You got to search. And you can go up and down stairs, and there was you could find keys and unlock doors to get to other areas of the maze. And the, the maze generated uh, every every time you played, the maze was different, unless you resumed again that you'd already started. Okay, and um, and you begin you can you be going through these rooms and and levels, killing guards and searching chests, trying to find more ammunition and grenades and maps and and keys and things. And every now and again, even if you went into a room where you'd been before, the guards would still be dead. But every now and again, this super guard would just appear appear randomly and hunt you down. And you had to, the only way to kill him was to shoot him a lot of times, like five or six times, or hit him with a grenade. Throw a grenade at him. And <laughs> uh, he was like a, like a boss, and he would he would he would just appear randomly. You know, if you stayed in one spot too long, or when you moved to a room, he'd suddenly be there. If you moved into a new room, sometimes there'd be guards plus this guy that would be there. Or if you moved back into a room you've already been to, thinking it was safe, sometimes he'd be there, and he would just hunt you down. You have to kill him real quick. And uh, to, so to control to control your man, which was this guy, you had to use the the keyboard. So you use the U I O J K L M comma dot keys, full stop keys. Um, so you have to use nine keys to control him. 
and then there was nine keys to control which way you were going to fire your gun or throw the grenade and that was QWE, ASD, ZXC. So you're using 18 keys. Okay. And the, the S key was, uh, the K key just meant stop in the middle of the movement. Okay. And then I think it was space bar to fire and also space bar to search. You'd hold down space bar and it would search a dead body. You could find bullet, bullets and keys on a dead body or whatever, armor. And uh, also to search chests, open chests was hold down the space bar and there was a trick for making the counter count twice. I think it was held in the space bar, and something like hold down the return key or something, and it would count down twice as quick when you're opening chests because they would take maybe two minutes to open, maybe a minute, maybe two minutes to open. The little counter would count down, and you didn't want this chap, this this super SS guard appearing behind you when you were opening a chest because you'd have to turn around really quickly and shoot, 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 or throw the grenade. I think T was throw the grenade. T was throw the grenade, I think. Um, anyway. There's all documentation on, on um, websites to help you work out what the commands are. But, uh, and this is Biles Toe, a great game uh, by Mangrove, Mangrove, Mangrove Jack or Mangrove Snowshoe or something his name was, Mangrove somebody. Um, Aztec, again this would generate each time, the map would generate new each time and there'd be piles of garbage you'd have to search. And monsters you'd have to kill, this is like a, a panther sort of thing here. But there'd be skeletons dancing around and and all sorts of monsters you have to shoot and chests to open so this is this is sort of like a this is like a, a look down view of the map and this is like a side view it's a different different game of course aztec and castle wolfenstein different games but similar sort of mechanics you know you'd have to shoot and throw grenades uh, and this one here is where you could place explosives and then run away so if a big monster was coming towards you you could place this place an explosive on the ground which would explode in three seconds and then run like hell <laughs> And get away from it and hopefully you blow up the big monster uh, or the monster you couldn't kill uh, apple panic where you'd uh, climb ladders and, and dig holes in platforms and drop the and when these monsters fill in the hole you could press a key to fill in the hole and if you filled the hole in bottom before they dug their way out then you'd kill them they drop them down levels and kill them um, great software music comp was a, comp a, a program where you could type in music or there was also songs already that came with it and you could load that music in and the notes would dance across the screens that played the, as it played the music using the Apple II's built-in sound, sound capabilities, which played, played beautiful music back then. Um, I remember my brothers and I, especially my brothers, I remember my, my, my younger brother especially typed in um, the music, it took him nearly a whole weekend, I think, <laughs> to type in the music for Music Box Dancer. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 sort of music like that it was, music box dancer, and he spent the whole weekend, weekend typing in the music for that. <laughs> so if you find my backup of music comp on Asimov or one of the Apple II archives, have a look and see if it's still at the music box, box dancer. My brother Peter typed that in back in 1983, early 83. And there's Star Blazer by Tony Suzuki. Tony did a lot of great games for the Apple II. Good on you, Tony. Hats off to you too. A lot of great games and Dan Gorland's Choplifter. Hats off to you too, Dan. I've exchanged a lot of emails with Dan, uh, maybe in, the, in around about 2005 or 2010. Dan and I were in a sent a lot of emails to each other backwards and forwards. Great guy. Um, and uh, yeah, the people that wrote the Apple II software are still approachable today. You, you send them an email, you find out, find out their contact details, send them an email, and they'll reply to you. <laughs> okay, try and track down one of these developers today that are developing games. You could send them a thousand emails and they wouldn't reply. Uh, fair enough, they get so much spam. Okay, but um, that's how it was back then. And today. And uh, that's just some of the great software that was on the Apple II. And this, this screen to me with all these applications and games just brings back so many memories. Um, beautiful games, great fun to play, often tons of keys to press. And like in Castle Wolf time, when, when that guard appeared, he would scream at you, ah, you know, Schweinhund, Schweinhund, <laughs> halt! And he'd, he'd scream at you, and it would scare you. And you'd be trying to, <laughs> you'd be trying to aim the gun at him, press the T key to throw the grenade, or press the key to throw, to, to shoot at him. Um, what was the key to shoot? I can't remember. The G key? I can't remember what it was to shoot. Um, You'd be trying to shoot him, <laughs> and of course you got 18 keys to press already for move and aim, 
uh, because you'd be trying to move away from him while you're trying to aim at him because he'd be running straight at you. Uh, you know, you'd just uh, be so much fun to try and, try and kill him. And when you killed him, <laughs> you had a, maybe a minute or two of peace before another, another super guard appeared. And uh, yeah, great, great times. And this this chap here, Boss Toad, you'd move around a map with an axe and a shield, and you'd be attacking other, and one other opponent. And you you could hack his arm off, and then you'd see his arm with the axe lying on the ground, and then you you try and hack his shield arm off, and you you know, if, try not to kill him. You try and keep him alive as long as you can. And his arm and his arm, his shield arm, and that would be lying here, and his weapon arm might be lying down here, and he'd, he'd have no arms in that left. So then he, the, the guard would try and run for the, the, the opponent would try and run for the exit. There was exit discs where you could warp to another level. And the, the computer opponent would then move to another, or, or your person you're playing, I guess, um, would move to another move to another level and get to safety. So you'd be trying to track them down and, and beat them to the disc before they got there. And uh, chopping into their back and whatever you could chop before they got to the disc and kill them. Uh, brutal, yes, of course, but we're talking about very pixelated graphics, and uh, you know, uh, a, a, a purple a purple stump on a with a, a funny looking axe lying on the ground with a little bit of coloured pixel around it, mo, you know, magenta coloured pixel or whatever lying around, around it to simulate blood. Yeah, wasn't really, <laughs> wasn't really graphics. Uh, it wasn't really graphic. Beautiful for the time, and still nostalgic for me. So back then, everything was brand new. The machines are very primitive. The OS, the operating system, the sound, the graphics, everything was just so basic and primitive, but it, but it was pioneering. Everything you did, even just typing in catalog on a disc to list the contents of catalog, everything felt like you were exploring. You know? And um, you know, often discs would have errors and you'd have to try and fix them using um, a bag of tricks or one of those other programs. and. Uh, I don't think I ever managed to repair a disc that was damaged uh, using those programs, but you try, you just explore stuff, you know, and you'd explore um, programming basic at peaks and pokes, and uh, there were shape tables to explore where you could create shapes and load them into tables, and that would be a much faster way of handling shapes, and um, uh, changing the Apple II font, and uh, you know, all these different things, low-res graphics, high-res graphics, uh, HDR1, HDR2, so you could do screen flipping. All that sort of thing. Every program you wrote, no matter how simple, felt like you'd done something unique, brand new, something no one else had done yet. That's what it felt like. It was a real pioneering and exploring spirit to everything. People formed clubs and friendships with the, over the Apple II, and they shared programs and information freely. So yeah, piracy was a problem. Uh, people did share their, 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 their game discs and their copies of copies of copies of game discs. Everything was sh shared freely. But that was part of the community spirit as well. Uh, you know, if you went round, round to someone's house, they might have two or three 40 disc boxes of, of discs, and none of those discs would be originals. They'd all be copies of copies of copies of copies. Uh, what that, that, was un that was normal. Okay. Um, I've got a lot of original Apple II software in, in storage, um, and some of it's still in the shrink wrap. Um, but um, not many people did, back in the early 80s, not many people had originals. It was all copies of copies, unfortunately. And piracy did harm the platform. I do admit that. Uh, but it was pioneering and exploring and sharing. Um, you know, the, 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 hippie, the hippie spirit from the 60s and 70s had carried over into, into computing in the 80s, especially the early 80s. And everything was all about exploring and trying to push the hardware as far as you could and seeing what you could do and uh, what you could create. And if it was a simple program like print your name and then go to 10, um, that still felt thrilling to write. And, and uh, you know, just, just being able to get the computer to do something for you was just such a thrill, uh, no matter how basic. Okay, so how much did things cost back then? We're talking about the very early 80s. How much did things cost in the very early 80s? And I'm talking, all my prices are Aussie dollars. And an Aussie dollar is about 0.75 US dollars, which is about 0.4 UK pounds, round about. Okay, but you can check with your latest currency converter if, it's, if you're watching this uh, and want to see what, it's, what an Aussie dollar is worth. Um, so got, I, I had a second-hand Apple II clone. 
I bought a slimline floppy drive, no brand. I bought that. That was brand new. I bought the secondhand floppy drive, uh, Apple II clone, but I bought a brand new floppy drive from the same person I bought the secondhand clone from. He was a bit of a dealer, wheeler dealer guy. Um, I'll talk about 80 column cards and 16 kilobyte memory expansion cards. Floppy disks secondhand, floppy disks brand new. Yes, you could buy secondhand floppy disks in 1982 and so on. Uh, what cassette tapes cost and my Akai radio cassette player. Okay. So my second-hand Apple II clone was $650 in about February, March 1983, okay? So I'd finished high school, I was working on a farm full-time, and I was worried that everything I'd learned about the Apple II I was going to forget, and I wanted to play the game still, Apple Panic, and uh, Biles Toad, I think Biles Toad was later, Apple Panic, um, Artillery, Sabotage, those Apple II games that were around then. I, I wanted to still play games, and... Um, and I'd done a lot of basic programming and I didn't want to forget. I was worried I was going to forget what to do and peaks and pokes, I'd been exploring those. So I wanted to keep going with that. So I saved up and bought an, app, an early Apple, uh, an Apple II clone in very early, I'm talking, we're talking about February, March, 1983, I bought that. Uh, $650 it was secondhand. Uh, in, by mid-1983, so I used, I used cassette tapes for about five or six months. And, uh, and then I said, that's it, I'm buying a floppy drive. That's it, I'm going to bite the bullet. And that was about $600, brand new for a floppy drive. Again, none of these are real Apple II branded components. They're all, they're all clones. Um, uh, back then, I was looking at getting an 80, 80 column card, and that was about, 98, uh, about $90. And a 16 kilobyte memory expansion card was about $70. Uh, a color card, if you want to have color graphics on your computer, was about $70 as well. Um, I think there was a combined card with the memory expansion and the 80 column and the color card all combined into one card. I think that was about $100 or $120. And again, these are all prices that I was quoted by this same person that I bought the Apple II clone off. Okay. It was a bit of a wheel there, a dealer. Um, Second-hand floppy disks were $2. So that was at Computerland, which is about four hours bus drive from where I lived. So it's two hours up, get to computer land, buy the second-hand disks, wait a couple of hours for the next bus to be heading back down, uh, because you, or may, maybe an hour, and then catch the bus back, back home again. It was a long long bus ride for me. It was right up the other end of where I lived, the peninsula of land, okay, right across the other side of the city. Uh, so $2 for floppy disks. So you'd phone up before you went, and say, have you got any floppy second-hand disks on, in stock? Because they'd have, they'd have them on the box on the, on the counter, $2, computer land. And uh, they say, yeah, we've got, a, we've got a stack of about 20 here. Okay, I'm, I'm on the way. <laughs> they wouldn't hold them for you, they'd just sell them. But I, I'm on the way. And you'd hope that there would still be some there when you got there, because they'd go pretty quick. They'd, put, they'd get these second-hand disks from somewhere, I don't know where, and sell them. They wouldn't reformat them. No, they wouldn't reformat them. They'd have to, they'd have whatever data and programs are on the disc already. I'm pretty sure they had. I'm, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure on that one. Maybe they did reformat them. But they certainly have the labels from the customers and, and, and writing on the discs and writing on the sleeve. The old labels would still be there that, you know, um, fe February accounts or whatever would, would, would still be written on the, on the disc title. Uh, but they'd be selling them, selling them a second hand disc. I'm pretty sure they had been formatted, thinking about it now. And um, brand new discs, well, they're about five dollars each, and that's if I bought them through the school. I don't know why I bought second-hand discs for two dollars when I could buy them for five dollars. I think that was only a special deal through the school, and once I'd left school, I couldn't get that deal anymore, of course, and I, I didn't even ask. But I think uh, I think discs were a lot dearer than that if you bought them from a shop like Radio Shack or whatever. I think they're more like ten dollars each for a floppy disk. Um, so two dollars for a second-hand one seemed like a good deal back then. Uh, cassette tapes were anywhere from one to five dollars. The best tape I bought was about five dollars. You could buy cheap, much cheaper tapes for about a dollar each. Cassette tapes, and my Akai radio cassette player was seventy-five dollars. I still remember buying that from seventy-five dollars from Kmart in 1978. Okay, uh, so that's a cassette player I used, and, I'll, and we'll talk about more of that more later. Okay, and then we come on to the, 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 the benefits, so that's the costs, now we come on to the benefits and the fun I had, the games I played, the learning, the memories, the contacts I made. Um, 
you know, the, the, the sense of pioneering and exploring and learning, which you just don't get from, from, from computers today. People I, 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 I see in my classes, I, I teach classes, people I see in my classes that are touching computers for the first day, don't really get that sense of exploring and pioneering. They just want to know how to do this and I don't really want to, most people just don't want to expand further and explore further. Back then I had to learn everything I could about the Apple II. What, what all the memory addresses meant, where, you know, peaks and pokes, shape tables, fonts, <laughs> uh, you know the graphics how to do graphics and, and flip gra flip graphics panes to make it so you could you could write on one off-screen buffer and then flip it you know and all that sort of stuff people don't seem to want to learn that more more these days as much as much there are still people who want to learn it of course um, and a career in software development so the fun and games and exploring and memories are priceless and I've also had an awesome career in software development uh, spanning four decades or so Okay, so, um, so, so, priceless, really priceless. I've, I've worked for clients around the world um, and um, freelanced and set up my own consultancy and ran my own consultancy and uh, into teaching as well as doing projects after hours. I've, I've, I've got into teaching over the last decade or so, two decades. Um, and uh, still do lots of projects after hours and I'm, I still work for clients in, in my local area and also remote clients. I still do lots of work for clients and uh, it's awesome fun. I still love, I still love writing software. When I, when I touched my first Apple, t when I first touched my first Apple II keyboard, the, the Apple II, that was the, the school computer, electricity ran up my arms, okay? It was a, re a religious experience, it really was. And um, I knew what I wanted to do with my life. I wanted, I, I wanted to, Work with computers, but I didn't know what I could do. I didn't know back then that software development was a was a was a career I could pursue. <laughs> yeah, maybe I should talk about this as well. So the career counsellor at my high school, if you wanted to be a hairdresser or a motor mechanic, he could help you. Uh, if you wanted to do something in computers, he had no idea and he didn't want to find out. He just he just knew about the things that he knew about that maybe most students wanted to do. Maybe. Uh, a lot of the girls in my class wanted to be hairdressers. I remember that. Not all of them, but most of them, and um, wanted to be hairdressers. And most of the guys wanted to be car mechanics or get into a job with a local council or you know, working on roads or whatever. Um, you know, so there, not many people wanted to be software, software developers back then because they didn't know it was a career. And uh, and I love programming in in basic and and a little bit I'd done in machine code. I loved and and. Um, but I didn't know there was such a thing as a career as a software developer. My career counsellor at school couldn't help me. It was only later on I found out about that, uh, that it was possible. And that's what I pursued like crazy. Okay, so where are they now? <laughs> so my second second hand Apple II clone and my slim floppy drive and my first floppy disk and my cassette tape, my floppy disk, Sakai and all that sort of stuff. Okay, so I've got all these things here that I'm going to talk about. My first floppy disk, my first cassette tape. I had a box of 10 to 20 floppy disks. My Akai radio cassette player that I used. I also had 280, box, uh, two, 280 boxes of disks. Big long plastic boxes with a flip up lead and plastic sleeves in between so you could put them in groups of 10. And I think they contained 80 disks or 40 disks. It was more than 40. That no, was 80 disks. Uh, containing games and software I'd written and also games I'd copied. Uh, and my Apple IIc, which I purchased in about not in the, about the year 2000 for 25 Australian dollars. And I purchased that to transfer my few remaining Apple II discs to disc images for use of the emulators. So where are all these artifacts now? Well, my second, hand, my second hand Apple II clone's gone. I don't know where it went. While I was overseas working, my parents had a big clean out and a garage sale. And there was only the two of them watching the garage sale, and they had stuff outside the house, stuff in the garage, stuff in the lounge room, stuff in, in the in. We had like a, a, a sitting room, separate sitting room with a with a pool table in it, which my with a board on top where my Apple II was, and um, they couldn't keep track of everything, and and people were just stealing stuff like crazy. My father um, saw someone walking towards the car with a, a great one of these great big drop saws, and said. Who'd you, who, who'd, you, who'd you buy that off? And uh, the guy just laughed and kept walking towards the car. 
So people were stealing stuff like crazy from the drop source because my parents had no idea how to set one up and hadn't thought it through. And so did my Apple II get clone, clone, clone get sold for peanuts, like $10 or $5? Did it get thrown out? Did someone steal it? I, I got no idea. My parents didn't know. I asked them years later what happened to my Apple II. And, um, and they, they had no idea. I only asked them a few years later, what, what happened to Apple II? Where, where is it? Did you, did you keep it? No, it wasn't in any of the boxes they, they packed and they don't know what happened to it. So someone, someone had stolen it or it got thrown out. Uh, my Apple my Apple II, my slim, Slimline Apple II floppy drive, which was uh, I bought in, in the middle of 1983. Uh, that's still in the storage shed here. My first ever floppy disk, which is a, we saw an image of earlier, is in, a sto is in a storage shed. My first ever cassette tape and a couple of my other tapes are in a storage shed. Uh, I've got a box of 10 to 20 floppy disks, which are the first 10 or 20 floppy disks I got and they're in the storage shed, so they're safe. And they've all been converted to images for use with emulators. Uh, my Akai Radio cassette player is actually in the storage shed. I saw, I saw it a couple of months ago, and I go, oh, there's the old couple, the cassette, there's the old cassette player. So whenever I see it, I, I get all nostalgic. Uh, I had uh, two 80, 80, 80 boxes of discs uh, with games and software I'd written, as well as games and software I'd copied. And I don't know where they are. They, they went with the Apple II, thrown out, stolen, sold for a dollar. I don't know. And the Apple IIc I purchased secondhand in uh, in about 2000. Um, it's not working. It's in storage. And one day I'm going to repair it. So that's where they are now. <laughs> I wish I had these. Uh, it's bad enough the Apple II clone's gone, but I wish I had these two, two boxes of discs. I wish I had those, but they're gone. I don't know where, probably thrown out, maybe stolen, maybe sold for a dollar, I don't know. My parents couldn't tell me, they, they couldn't remember. They, 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 all they said to me about the garage sale was that, because uh, they, they had a house full of stuff and they were moving, and I just put it all out for sale on the lawn and inside the house and, and uh, in, in the sitting room and, and out the back, and, uh, and people were just walk, heaps of people were just walking through it all and stealing stuff. The drop saw got stolen, taken to the car, and my father saw a whole, whole lot of other stuff getting carried out that no one had paid for, so... Um, why? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, you live and learn, I guess. When you set up a garage sale, have one little area where people can go and uh, and watch it. But that's that. Them, them's the breaks. So in conclusion, if I just sum up this, this presentation uh, and my memories and my history with the Apple II, in four sort of words, I would say, it, it, okay, it was primitive, primitive hardware, uh, primitive storage media, and so on, primitive graphics, primitive sound, primitive development environments, very, very primitive, but it was a whole lot of fun. It was a real, real sense of fun and exploring and pioneering. I feel like you were a pioneer, you were, you were beating new trails into something that's never been done before. No one's ever been. <laughs> That's what it felt like. And for me, it, it led to an awesome career. So I'll forever be grateful to the Apple II. It'll, it'll, it'll be forever in my heart. Um, and Apple Company and Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak and the early people that were there at Apple will be forever in my heart and the beautiful, beautiful machine. The Apple II, the Apple II Plus, the Apple II GS, which I never got to use a, a real GS, but the Apple II, the Apple II Plus, the Apple II Euro Plus especially, just, I get, I get all teary when I think about them. Okay. Anyway, I hope this was interesting to someone out there. I'll probably get a ton of down votes, but that's just the way things are on the internet now. But anyway, have a nice day. Hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thanks for watching.